thanks to Liberating Truth's questions, I realized that I had one more video I had to do, maybe a couple more, on the KJV only blasphemy to really answer the deeper question behind it. There are a considerable number of people out there who do not even understand what God's inspired word means. When you hear people misuse Psalm 12, 6, verses 6 through 7, and it talks about God having pure words. When you hear people misuse um, verses like the word of God stands forever, they're not looking at all the verses that talk about what God says about his own word, so they interpret them out of context. And I'm going to try and set straight what the context is, but I don't know that I can do it in just one video because it's such a big topic. So we're going to start here at the point of action of this promise to preserve his word so that I can allay some fears about what it is and how it works. This is one of many verses on what theologians call verbal plenary inspiration. I'm just talking about how the original words that God intended us to know are preserved century after century. And it's the way that God preserves them that people are all confused about. So we're going to use this verse to show what kind of way God uses. And we've got other verses to go to. All right. Unfortunately, English translations, as usual, are very fuzzy. Um, right up here I'm using the NASB translation but they're all the same let me show you they're all wrong okay let me remove the notes at the bottom so you can see that's the NASB that's the NIV that's the KJV this, isn't, this is also the KJV but it's called authorized version and it has some minor differences okay this is the Douay Reims, the Catholic Bible that the KJV guys used a lot when they were trying to compile their own translation, and that's a proper procedure. This is Darby. This is Young's literal translation, which came out in 18, I want to say 1895. Uh, because of the many translation problems with the KJV, everybody was frustrated. And so in 1895, he tried to come up with a completely literal translation, and, and therefore it's not really that good. But for word tracking to the Greek, here's the Greek up here. This is one of the manuscripts. Let me show you the rest of them. Um, for, word, for word tracking, this is a good translation. But the English sense of it is, not, is usually fuzzy, as you can see here. Look. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That's so fuzzy, you don't know what it says. Okay, and the other English ones are no better. Look at this. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. What is he talking about? What constitutes the manifestation of the Spirit? What does that mean? All right, and the other ones are no better. Look, of course, they're all copying from the King James, except for the ones that are older, like Douay Reims. King James is copying from the Douay Reims. It's copying from the Geneva Bible here. All right, in fact, it's exactly copying from the Geneva in this verse. But no matter which version you look at, and I got the rest of them here, Bible and basic English. Okay, here's the New Jerusalem. It's still all fuzzy. That particular manifestation of the Spirit is granted for the general good. Whose general good? People? Okay? And, and, and what it constitutes the manifestation of the Spirit? See, this is why I hate the English or any translation. It's fuzzy. This is the main problem of translations. They're fuzzy. Manifestation of the Spirit. Well, if you talk to the Holy Rollers, they got one definition of manifestation of the Spirit. If you talk to an Anglican, he's got another definition of the manifestation of the Spirit. What does manifestation mean? Yeah, well, we're going to go through it. All right, that's why you need the Greek here. And you need to know what the words mean. Of course, Gail bleeping vile Ripplinger would throw out all the lexicons because, and she can't even read the Greek, so how she could, could she know? According to her, everybody's evil except her, of course. 
All right, you can't know what these words mean, so therefore you can't know what the translation means because it's too vague. You got to go back to the original language. This is the word for manifestation in English. This is its word in Greek, phanerosis. Well, what the heck does it mean? Okay. And all the Greek texts, so that we can get rid of the KJV only people, all the Greek texts agree. This is Textus Receptus right here. It's the only one, well, it's not the only one. It's, it's, it's wrong because it's got this capitalized. This is a correct reading of the verse. This is not correct. This is Tischendorf's copy. That's 4th century. This is, what, 16th century, 15th century. Right? It's wrong. You don't capitalize pneumatas, even though it does mean the spirit. That was what they did in late Greek. So somebody must have, you know, done that to Tischendorf, and then these guys copied from it. So then the, the Texas Receptus is copied from the Alexandrian Tischendorf. Got that? So much for the KJV only being entirely stupid and uneducated and not willing to become educated about how we got the word we have. All right, so now let's go to this. What is phonerosis? What does it mean? This is really important. Okay? Have a look in the lower left-hand window. Let me widen it for you so you can see it better. Okay? My mouse has to be on phonerosis for you to see it. Making public clear announcement and disclosure. It's not that he shows up. In English, manifestation makes it sound like he shows up, like you suddenly can see him. That's not what it means. It means disclosure. It specifically is about, about proclamation, information, giving out information, attestation, bringing to light, disclosure. Got that? Now, if we change the word in English, Instead of saying, but to each one is given the manifestation, if we change it to disclosure, and specifically due diligence disclosure is what they're talking about here, that makes up, that's a wholly different idea, isn't it? But to each one is given the disclosure, and it's not really of the Spirit, it's by the Spirit. Okay? It means belonging to. This is, this is one of those things that, that's really important to know. He's the one doing the disclosing. It's the spirit doing the phonerosis. This is phonerosis in Greek. And instead of manifestation, it should be translated disclosure. And to pneumatas, to, that's a definite article, pneumatas, pneumatas, means the spirit. Pneumatas is the genitive form of pneuma, which means spirit in Greek. Okay? It's saying that the spirit is disclosing. And the thing is, and you can't know this except if you know the Greek, Paul switches to using nouns to make it more dramatic. In Greek, it's more dramatic if you use nouns than if you use verbs. Okay, so that's why they switch to participles and, and nouns. Okay, so this should be saying, but to each one is given, and that's, that's all right. All right. The disclosure by the Spirit. That would be better English so we know what we're talking about here. The Spirit does the disclosing. Okay, and then the last half where it says for the common good, that's not really what it says. Greek preposition pros means toward, for, in the face of. Really, it means face to face. Okay, to is a definite article, and that means the, and it's a neuter here. But um, they use definite articles a lot. Okay, sumpharon, that's another verbal noun. Look at the bottom screen. Okay has to do with that which is profitable. Okay? Bringing together, gather, collect. You see that? And then Bauer Danker, who Gail Ripplinger hates, except that she shouldn't because Bauer Danker often praises the KGV, which proves she didn't do her homework. It means to bring together in a heap. To confer a benefit. To a team. Okay?